Sneed, Patrick F. McManus. Back in the shadows of time, when I was a youngster, a man by the name of Darcy Sneed lived in our county. I don't think I ever heard anyone say a kind word for Sneed, and I'm sure nobody ever heard me say one. He was always showing up without notice when and where he wasn't wanted and causing folks grief. Several times he scared the daylights out of me, catching me alone in the woods. But except for one time, I always managed to escape. As far as I know, Sneed never smiled, nor cracked a joke. He was cold and hard and tight-lipped and generally unlikable. Besides that, he was the game warden. Now the truth is, I seldom broke the game laws, not because I had any love for rules and regulations, but because it seemed unsporting. Once, though, my friend Wretch and I did sneak down to the creek early one morning three days before the opening of fishing, fishing season. We hid in some deep brush along the bank and at the first hint of dawn cast our salmon eggs out toward a log jam, where we knew some cutthroat had to be waiting. But I was so filled with dread and guilt that I couldn't enjoy fishing and I knew that if I caught anything it would just compound the existing dread and guilt I felt. Wretch, on the other hand, didn't seem burdened by any doubts and was intently working his lines so the eggs would drift under the logs. Somehow I had to impress upon him that what we were doing was wrong. I searched for the right words, the kind of words that would convey to him the deep and moral and ethical implications of our actions. Then I thought of them. Sneed's coming. Wretch instantly grabbed the deep moral and ethical implications and reeled in his lines so fast only its being wet saved it from instant combustion. We stashed our rods under a log and beat it out of there, hurrying down the creek trail. Wretch was in front, and as, we, as he rounded a bend, he turned his head slightly and set out the corner of his mouth. Good thing you saw him coming. Who, I said, already have forgotten the lie. Sneed. And there was Sneed, striding purposely toward us down the trail. Howdy, Mr. Sneed, we said politely. Sneed didn't say anything for a moment. He just let his glare rove over us, rove over our quaking carcasses. The seconds passed, ticked off by the sound of our dripping sweat. What you boys doing here? he demanded finally. We answered simultaneously, looking for a cow, pulling up thistles. Sneed didn't smile at these contradictory explanations. He was not a fun-loving man. I'm going to ask you boys one more time, what you doing here? By now I'd forgotten who had told him what, so I nudged Wretch to go ahead and answer, he being the more experienced and polished liar. But Sneed's glare had penetrated Wretch's brain and tangled his speech mechanism. We was just pulling up cows, he said. Sneed replied with another long silence. Then he said, let me see if I've got this straight. You were down here on the creek at five in the morning pulling up cows. Is that correct? Right then I figured Sneed was going to throw us in jail and for what? Not being able to think of a decent lie when we had to? Sneed reached out and thumped a bony finger on Rich's chest. I know you and you know that you boys were down here fishing, getting a jump on the season. I'd arrest you both, but I didn't catch you at it. Next time, I will. Sneed knew how to put fear into a person. If he didn't manage to keep people from breaking the game laws, he at least kept them from enjoying it. He never forgot me after that morning on the crick, having filed me away in his memory bank as a person who took the game laws lightly and who, wore, and who bore watching. Sneed was not one of those game wardens who come semi-attached to the seat of a pickup truck. He knew how to walk and was infamous for suddenly materializing in remote and roadless places. There was a friend of our family who was widely regarded as the best trapper in our part of the state. During the winter, he would snowshoe far back in the high country to work his trap line. It's real nice to be up there alone in the winter, he told me once. There's just you and the silence and the snow and sneed. Numerous theories were set forth regarding the game warden. One was that there were actually three Sneeds. This was based on multiple sightings of Sneed in different parts of the county at the same time. Men would shake their heads and say, 
There's something unnatural about Sneed. One time I was sitting in the kitchen of a chronic poacher, and he told me how he had outsmarted Sneed once. I strapped my heels down on my snowshoes and walked backwards with the deer over my shoulder. Funniest thing you ever seen. I hid in some trees at the top of a rise to watch, and pretty soon Sneed hits my trail. He looks one way and the, the other, and then he takes off following my tracks towards where I'd been. The poacher nearly split his side laughing at the memory of his little trick. His wife glared at him. Now, Otis, you tell the boy the rest of the story you hear. Otis sobered up and reluctantly finished the tale. Well, when I got the deer back to my truck and started scraping the frost off the winders, there's old C Sneed sitting inside smoking a cigarette, calm as you please. Cost us hundreds of dollars, the wife snarled. Ain't no deer worth no hundred dollars. During that sneed, the poacher muttered, glowing into his coffee grounds at the bottom of his cup. Another time, three men poached a deer close to the bottom of a rocky gorge and waited until dark to sneak it up to their car, parked on the road a half a mile up the mountain. The going was rough, and as they fought their way upwards over logs and rocks and through brush, one of the poachers popped down on the ground for rest and gasped, Man, this is hard. It's a good thing there's four of us to drag this, de this here deer, because otherwise I don't think we'd make it. One of the other poachers looked around county heads in the darkness. Ain't supposed to be but three of us dragging this deer, he said nervously. Ain't supposed to be nobody dragging it, Sneed said. Over the years, I heard dozens of such tales about C Sneed, some true, some imaginary, but their net effect was to leave me with the impression that the game warden was possessed of powers not generally found among the psychic accessories of ordinary human beings. I never went afield with rod or gun that I didn't feel Sneed's presence. One of my great fears was that I would sometime lose count and catch one fish over my limit and Sneed would nab me. Then I'd be fined a hundred dollars, and since neither my family nor I ever seen a hundred dollars altogether at the same time, I would have to go to jail. Well, I wouldn't be able to stand being in jail, so I'd have to break out and steal a car and escape in a hail of gunfire. After that, I'd probably kill a bank guard and be fatally wounded myself, and while I was sprawled on the sidewalk breathing my last, a reporter would come up to me and ask, What made you do it, son? And I'd tell him, I caught one fish over my limit. It was easy to see how it all worked out, so any time I got anywhere near my limit, I practically wore my fish out counting them. It was a heavy burden for a kid, especially for one who didn't have any better grasp of mathematics than I did. In light of this background, it would be clear that my decision to fish the forbidden waters of the creeks that fed the town reservoir was not arrived at casually. Despite all my fears and misgivings, I was simply overpowered by the logic that led me to the conclusion that that creek had to be crammed full of giant eastern brook. I should mention here that water pollution as such was unknown at the time. It was simply referred to then as dumping stuff in the creeks. A few enlightened and farsighted individuals would occasionally speak out in the cause of pure water. I wish fix folks would stop dumping stuff in the cricks, they would say, thereby branding themselves forever after as wide-eyed eccentrics. The only creek that was sacrosanct was that of the town reservoir, the townspeople being in unanimous agreement that they didn't want anyone dumping stuff in their drinking water. My reasoning, however, was this. A dry fly wouldn't dirty the water, I would be providing a civic service by removing trout that certainly had to be dirty in it. And finally, my family got its water out of the well. There was only one flaw in this logic. Sneed. My plan of attack seemed foolproof, however. I would sneak into the reservoir under cover of pre-dawn darkness, follow the creek up into the dense woods that would provide me cover through the day, then do my fishing and return after nightfall. I would carry a few carefully selected flies, a length of leader, and some line, and cut myself a willow pole when I reached the spot where I wanted to start fishing. The night before I launched my assault on Reservoir Creek, I went to bed early, chuckling evilly over the boldness of the plan, 
beautiful even in its very simplicity. Ole Sneed, as I told myself, had finally met his match. Thus it was that I found myself returning home late the following evening with a fine catch of brook trout. The fishing had been just as fantastic as I had known it to be, or would be. Nevertheless, I was filled with fear and remorse and a dark sense of foreboding about what the future held for me. Part of the reason for these feelings was that I knew I had deliberately and maliciously broken the law, discovering too late that I possessed neither the temperament nor the taste for crime. The rest of the reason was that I was sitting alongside of Sneed in the front seat of his dusty old Dodge sedan. As I had come sneaking up over the edge of the logging road on my way out of the reservoir basin, there was Sneed sitting in his car with the lights off. True to his fashion, he didn't say a word. He just leaned over, pushed open the door on the passenger side, and motioned for me to get in. For an instant, I thought of running, but then decided against it. You just can't move all that fast when you're paralyzed. <laughs> While Sneed drove down along in his usual silence, I tried to appeal to his sympathy, even though from all the reports I'd heard, no one ever detected a smidgen of it in him. Look, Mr. Sneed, I said, maybe it don't matter none to you sending a kid to jail, but don't you care nothing about that poor bank guard? What's his little children going to do without him? What bank guard? Before I could explain, a voice from the back seat said, Ain't no use pleading with him, boy. When he was born, they, he they heated him white hot and tempered him in oil, and he's been hard ever since. This dismal report had issued from a tall, lean young man sprawled across the back seat and chewing on a match. He was covered with dirt and bits of grass and brush, apparently acquired in an attempt to escape from Sneed. What did he get you for? I asked my fellow criminal feeling an instant kinship with him? Nothing at all. I was just up there in the mountain trying out my new jack light. It must have riled up this old buck deer, because first thing I know, he'd come charging at me out of the brush. I had to shoot him to save my life. Shut up, Leroy, Sneed said. You can tell it all to the judge. About that time, we drove up in front of my house. Sneed stopped the car and motioned for me to get out. You mean you ain't arresting me, I said. What for, Sneed said. It ain't my responsibility to keep folks from fishing that reservoir. It's the water departments. They own the water and they own the fish in it. Besides, I get my drinking water from a well. The game warden went on to tell me in his tone of cold certainty that he would turn me over to the water department for appropriate punishment if he ever caught me within a mile of the reservoir again. I nodded solemnly, even though inside I was chucking silently to myself. Old Sneed did have a soft spot after all, and I, with my boyish charm, had touched it. No doubt I had reminded him of his own son, or perhaps even of himself as a boy. Even before the sound of Sneed's old dodge had faded off in the distance, my resolve to retire from a life of crime had vanished, and I was already plotting my next raid on the reservoir. Even if he did catch me, I knew the game warden wouldn't have the heart to turn me into the water department. What changed my mind was an item my grandmother read in the newspaper the following week. I see by the paper where a fellow by the name of Leroy Sneed was fined a hundred dollars for poaching deer, she said. When are folks ever going to learn to obey the law? One folk learned right then, and I'm happy to report that I've never intentionally violated so much as a single game regulation since. Oh, I've been tempted several times, but even though Sneed has been dead for 15 years now, you just never can tell about a man like that.